Okay, so thank you. So uh, we're now ready for our final presentation of the day. So I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Hall from the Yukon Paleontological Program, I'm sorry, um, who will be talking to us today about some creative storage solutions to make uh, the most out of uh, tight spaces. So, Elizabeth, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so I've retitled my talk. It's actually hanging out and hooking up. Um, and this photo here is Geasley Balzar, and he's actually a restorationist, and he's my go-to guy whenever I have issues um, dealing with awkward objects. Um, mounting, he does casting for us. Um, we are not a museum-based program, but we actively collect specimens every summer. And so space is always an issue for us. So just a little bit of background. Um, it's the Yukon Paleontology Program. We were created in 1995, and we really came out of the Umbrella Final Agreements, which were our land claim agreements in the Yukon. Um, from that came the Historic Resources Act, which was how are we going to deal with historic objects, cultural objects, um, paleontological objects. Um, out of that, too, came the Yukon uh, Beringia Interpretive Center. And so this is a museum that is associated with us. Um, they are in the museum's unit, and we provide technical and scientific support. So we advise them in terms of um, layout, in terms of content. Uh, we help with their interpretive programming. Um, but our specimens aren't actually housed at the Beringia Center. When the Beringia Center started in 1997, we were fairly young, so we were about two years. And prior to that, any um, fossil specimens that had been collected went to Ottawa. They went to the Canadian Museum of Nature. They went to the Canadian Museum of Civilization. And so we really just started beginning uh, collecting in 1995. So uh, at the Beringia Center, you'll see uh, completely articulated specimens that are based on um, remains that have been found elsewhere. So for example, that uh, Woolly mammoth is a Jefferson mammoth that actually was found in Wisconsin. Um, that short-faced bear is based on one that was found in Illinois. And those two taxidermied specimens are Segas, which are actually my favorite Ice Age mammal. And you can see Val um, down in the bottom corner there, carefully inspecting those taxidermied specimens for infestations. And we were involved in rehousing, uh, reinterpreting um, those particular individuals. Um, we got them in 1995 from uh, basically Russia, and this was prior to a big decline in the Sega population. They are critically endangered, but they're very cute. So really, we are an active research collection. Um, we are responsible for all the fossils that are found in the Yukon since 1995. Um, we also work with the First Nation um, groups in terms of their, their collections. So for example, up in Old Crow, I'll be going there on Monday to work with the collections that we collected this past summer. Um, currently, we have close to 33,000 specimens that are in our database, but that's not the actual number of specimens that we have because we are backlogged by two years in terms of cataloging. Um, and this summer to come, probably, we'll collect another 6,000 specimens. Um, so our collection ranges from anything that's about a billion years old to about 4,000 years old. Um, and they're all different uh, types of fossils and different types of fossilization. But for the most part, the majority of our collection is Ice Age mammal uh, remains, and that probably makes up like 80% of our collection. Um, and we are responsible for collecting the fossils all over the Yukon, so it's actually quite a big area. So here is um, just on the bottom corner there, that's what we collected this past summer from Old Crow. Um, over to the side is Hirsch Island. Um, uh, and then uh, also there are 
there is actually uh, anyways it doesn't matter but, um some remains from uh dawson city and so those are our three main localities that we collect from every summer um dawson city is an active mining area so basically the miners are exposing the ground and uh, we're quite um thankful because we can actually uh, collect this really valuable collection so they're coming out of the permafrost um it's like it fell into a freezer in time um and because of that um we can actually get biological information such as ancient DNA, we can do some radiocarbon dating, we can do stable isotope analysis, and that's part of our active research collection. We work with scientists from all around the world, and basically we are looking into um, these fossils to learn more about past environments. So uh, we have a lot of specimens, and we have a space problem. So. Uh, these four pictures show basically the evolution of the main paleontology lab space through time. So um, the paleo lab in 2004, we had basically static um, uh, open shelves. Um, most of the fossils were just laid out on the shelves themselves. Um, very little was actually packed away. Um, in our lab, we have our paleontology collections, but we also have comparative material. Um, and so one of the big pushes was to um, reduce the amount of shelving by putting it on the mobile um, shelving storage. And so that was done around 2005, which was great. It actually created more space, um, easier access, and we could use the pre-existing shelving that we already had. Um, by 2010, um, this is showing basically just a view from my office, which is pretty tiny. Uh, we have a garage, but we weren't actually using that garage. Instead, we had the lane cabinets in front of that garage um, blocking that access, and you could only access it from outside. We had all these freezers in our lab space, which are important because sometimes we have specimens that we need to keep frozen, but these also were archaeology's uh, freezers as well. So by 2014, we actually got another space, which will be coming up, um, another bay, which is still part of our building, but it's an outside access. And so we were able to rearrange our space. We were able to take those freezers out of our space, put them in the bay, and uh, move those lane cabinets so now that we had access to that garage. But still, by this point, that garage was basically just extra storage. So this is showing um, the bay. So we got that bay to by 2014. We were able to put in some static um, shelves, but you can see that we have a lot of specimens that are on the ground. Um, by 2018, Really, that space hasn't changed that much. We've put in a couple more shelves. Um, the thing with our building is that it is not purpose-built. Um, these are old uh, paint uh, buildings. And so um, our floors are not even. We have big sumps in the middle of it. And so we try to make the best with what we have. Um, so down in the bottom there, you'll see uh, that's the garage. 2010 and we that first picture that I showed was that same skull that's from Dawson and uh, eventually um, we turned it into our dirty lab so this is where we can actually clean our specimens so obviously space is an issue um, we are hoping that in the future we will have a purpose-built facility um, and maybe there's a potential for a research station up in Dawson, which will house some of the specimens. Um, but for now, I'm thinking maybe we just need some more off-site um, storage, and possibly again would be the way to go in terms of dealing with um, our active research collection. So space is an issue. Um, this is probably my favorite storage solution that we came up with. Um, as I said, we have researchers from all around the world who come and use our, 
our collection. And one summer, we had Dick Mole, who's probably one of the Probocidian, foremost Probocidian spe uh, specialists, who came through and looked at all of our mammoth specimens. And one particular specimen is called the Gold Run Mammoth. It, uh, it's fairly complete in terms of the amount of bones. And he went through and enumerated the ribs for us, which was great. And so at this point, those ribs were really just sitting on those open shelves, and they were just piled up. And uh, the access wasn't easy. Um, I didn't want to put them back in that same position. So I was chatting with Geesley about what could we do in terms of storing these ribs in a different way, in a way that I could use it as part of our comparative collection collection when I'm inventorying in the winter. And uh, he said, well, why not use pegboard? And I thought, that's great, but we don't actually have a lot of wall space. But what we do have is that movable shelving storage. And there was about a foot gap at the end of that shelf. And so we had all this wall space. So I thought, well, maybe let's put it up there. So we did. So this past uh, month, we decided to continue on. So that was 2015 that we put up that first rack of ribs. And uh, we decided we could probably put at least three more up on that space. And so um, this is sort of a step-by-step -step as to how to build it. So what we did was we bought the pegboard. We put a frame around the edge of it, and we also put a brace down the middle, which helps to keep it um, more rigid. Our ribs aren't really that heavy, but we want to put a lot of ribs on it. So we want to ensure that it was strong. Um, we screwed the frame into the pegboard itself. When we put it up on the wall, we made sure we screwed it into a stud and that we didn't block any outlets. <clears throat> So our first time around in 2015, we used these hooks. Um, they're basically curved pegboard hooks with screws, and we actually screwed the screws into the hole. Um, the first time around, we just used the polyethylene foam rod that we got probably from Gaylord Archival. And we slid it down the center, um, and basically this gave it a cushion. And then we also used um, some ribbon so that we could tie the um, specimen to that hook itself. So the next time around when we did it, um, we had used up all of our foam rod. If we were to order some, because we're up in Whitehorse, it would take some time. So we thought, well, I kind of want to try a different style. So what else can we do? Um, Geesley really wanted to uh, put something at, either at the tip of the hook itself, because it is actually a little sharp, just in case it might pierce through the foam, or to somehow encase the hook, um, just to basically provide a little more protection. Um, he really wanted something cylindrical, and so uh, we started looking into using backer rod. Um, we ended up going to the hardware store. We just went to Canadian Tire. We bought the backer rod that was available there, and it cost about six fifty, or about fifteen feet. Um, I'm not certain if this is archival. We did check into the specs. It is closed cell. Um, they guaranteed that they didn't use any lubricants and. It's fairly cheap. Um, it was locally available, so it was easy access, and it's cylindrical. Um, the only thing that I didn't have is a hole, so we actually had to create a hole, and we just used basically a foam cutter in order to do so. Um, here I have some relative prices. Um, it is relatively cheaper than buying back a rod from uh, Car McLean, but with Car McLean, you know that it is archival um, as well with Gaylord. So the foam backer rod needs to be longer than the hook itself. Um, you need to bevel one of the edges so that it actually covers up uh, where the screw goes into the pegboard. Um, the foam cutter 
uh, Geasley actually ended up making a guide for it. Um, and that first picture with the first guide around, uh, you can see um, that he's using both his hands and there was some waste and there actually was some burnage. So uh, in the second guide, he didn't actually have to use uh, both his hands and you can see that he's actually quite happy with the hole he made. <laughs> Um, also recommended, if you're going to do this, to do it in a fume hood because it is quite stinky. Um, so we just used vinyl tubing that we got from the hardware store once again. Um, the vinyl tubing should be a little bit longer than the hook because you're trying to basically stop that um, point from poking through. Um, also, once again, bevel the one end, which we just used an X-Acto knife. Um, we just used unbleached cotton string. I feel like maybe this is a little too thin. It could potentially break, but if it does, then we'll just restring it up. Um, you can get various sizes of the curve tip. Um, for our purposes, the two inch was uh, the best. And the way that we did it was to string the vinyl tubing first, then to shove the hook into the beveled end of the vinyl tubing, and then to do the same with the backer rod. And basically you want to make it flush so that it covers up where that screw goes. So once you create your hook, then you can screw it in. And the great thing about screwing it in is that if you screw it up, you can just screw it out and replace it. And so um, we also, I don't really have a good close up, but we, um, also, we're able to put it horizontally when we did the rack it up, which is basically dealing with caribou racks. Um, some other uh, issues that we have um, are basically what to do with skulls. And so this is our cervid cranial crisis, and this is throughout the different years. And I want you to focus on, we have um, an elk skull, so um, that first picture says leaning elk, and that really was just leaning up against that shelving unit. Um, in the next picture, it's 2005, and that elk skull has moved, but now it's just sitting on top of a shelf, ready to launch itself. Um, by 2010, we have it on top of those lane cabinets, which are blocking that garage door. And it's lying down, but it's still hanging off the edge. And so I really wanted to deal with this. I was afraid it was going to either just give me a headache or it was going to pierce my skin. So what I asked um, Giesle to do was to make a mount. And so he made a vertical stand. And he just basically bifurcated it at the end. He used Velcro to basically sit it in it. And then we put it on top of the shelf and we put a bar in front of it just in case we had an earthquake and it rocked forward. Right off to the left of that last photo, you can see that there's another elk rack. And this was a mount that he custom made once again. Um, where basically it's two hooks and we've cushioned it with the um, foam and we've lined it with tieback. So those custom mounts that Geesley makes are beautiful, but they are also time intensive. And we found this skull hooker, and this is what it's actually called, is a skull hooker. And these are used for um, European trophy, uh, game trophy. And so you can get different sizes. You can get the little hooker, you can get the big hooker, you can get the extra, extra large hooker. And they're pretty straightforward. Um, they, have, <laughs> they have a base that you, you mount to your wall. And, uh, and then it has this, um, this three-forked prong that sticks out, and you can adjust it. So you can move it up, you can move it down, you can move it left, you can move it right. And basically, you just insert it into that opening in the back of the skull. And it's a beautiful thing, which we've only played around with. We actually haven't mounted anything onto the wall because we actually don't have a lot of space to mount it to the wall. Definitely not big enough for the mammoth skull. 
And so that mammoth skull is the uh, mammoth that you saw in the first picture. And uh, this is the mount that Geasley was pondering when you saw him in that first picture. But he's not very happy with it, so this is another project for another day. And happy hooking. Thanks for hanging out. Thank <laughs> you.